I think a lot of Christian women don't want to be bad at things. They won't do things that don't come naturally to them right at first. So bread baking is a great example. They may have tried one time to make bread with no idea how yeast works or what's happening and it flopped. And then they are like, I can't do that. I am unable. Right. But if you just keep trying pretty soon, you're like, oh, I can do that. I do know how to, yeah. how to do this. Uh, so Rachel, you have another webinar coming up on culture building. I do. Uh, culture building, you're talking about culture building at the level of the home, yes. right? Yeah. And uh, that, that would be a key ingredient home by home coming together. That's a community, a town, and so yeah. on. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think is the, the key ingredient that has to go into uh, culture building in the home? I think there's probably a lot of key ingredients, but one for sure is uh, the ability to see the importance of little things and to think that investing yourself in something little that's seemingly unimportant is actually something God can use to do much bigger things. And I think a lot of Christian women who may think I'm supposed to be at home still think that there's something broken about the reality of the home, the reality of the kind of work that it is, like that that's a mistake that this is all dirty dishes and mess right. and things that that's like not part of God's design for how we. And, and because of the perennial temptation that there is when you're working hard on meal prep or right. getting some, making a special occasion or whatever, when you say uh, recognizing how important the little things are, that doesn't mean freaking out over somebody spilling something. Because, no, not because, that kind of recognizing how important they are. Uh, I think being willing to lay your life down for things that don't seem that significant is, that's the kind of thing I mean, which would mean not freaking out about things that you're like, I worked all day yesterday on this and now we're back to square zero today. Right. So um, so how, how would you describe the importance of the aroma of the home in these sorts of events. We're talking and by culture building, we're talking largely meals are a large part of this, right? Meals are for sure a big part of it. But I would say, uh, I think it's just loyalty to what the gospel actually looks like lived out when you have kids in your home. If you are freaking out about little things, if you are being uptight about appearances only and you don't care that you're being ugly at everyone and whatever, right. you're you're telling them lies. You know, you're you're raising your children in lies about the gospel. But on the same scale of little engagement, you can be living out the truth of the gospel, which is very compelling and beautiful and uh, winsome. And so I think that well. Culture is like, if you think about any other kind of culture, not just, not civilization culture, but like a yogurt culture. <laughs> it's like you, it's an environment that fosters multiplication of what's happening. So like if you're making yogurt, you put in the good bacteria, you know, you make sure that the bad bacteria is all dead. You put in the good bacteria, you have it at the right, at the right temperature and it takes over a much bigger body of Thanks. And so bread is that way. It's the kingdom of God, the leaven. The, the name, so the name of the game would be disproportionate impact. Totally. And, and being willing to invest yourself in knowing that that initial, that sort of that starter, that thing that you're doing is actually just pure and honest offering to God and asking God to multiply your efforts uh, makes the atmosphere of the home a place where it's joy and gratitude and delight in God that is multiplying all of the time. And we don't want to beat the analogy to death, but if you're... Why not? If, like, why, let's, we let's love, take we'd this, love to do that. Let's take it as far as it goes. If you're yeah. making... How do, you, how do you make sourdough? Uh, you have your... Well, you have your starter, which is the culture of the good bacteria. And then you get your dough going and then you add a little bit of the leaven to right. the flour and the water and the salt. And so the task is largely... Curating, Mixing. <laughs> curating the environment, bringing things the environment, together. Yes, the environment, the temperature, and the knowing that things are like, um, it's actually, a, I think since I started making sourdough, there were more times that I thought this is very spiritual. Like it comes up in, I mean, bread making, yeah. bread is in scripture, but actually doing it gives you a different, you're like, wow, that's interesting. Because if the starter is really active, 
if you've been feeding the starter right. and keeping it, it's like it's rising and falling really quickly. It's like you feed it, it's happy, it goes down. Well, it takes not very much of that kind of starter to make a lot of bread, right. you know, like, and it does it quickly and it does it really efficiently. And if it's kind of been in the fridge for a long time and it's, maybe it's not been reading its Bible for a while. <laughs> it's kind of it has a nice layer of yucky hooch on top of it. You can still stir it up and get it into the dough and it will make bread, but it will take longer and it With will an be, attitude, yeah. and, and the bread will be a little more tangy at the end and you'll have a, but it isn't, it's interesting how there are ways to cultivate, ways to cultivate something really little that makes bigger and faster impacts. And I think it, just an interesting side observation, the, the Lord says the kingdom of God is exactly like this, mm -hmm. like a woman who takes uh, yeast and puts it in three measures of flour. And of the, a couple of things is that's, um, th that's how much bread Sarah made. In, huge amounts of and, bread. And Isn't it like to, 90 loaves Yeah, or it'll, it'll feed a regiment. It'll yeah. feed a regiment. Yeah. Uh, so it's enough yeast for three measures, and the kingdom of God's like that. It's potent. It expands. Mm -hmm. It really goes. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And it, it's funny because when you work with it, it's such a, well, this is a great example of what we're talking about anyways. It's such a humble thing to be working on and doing. Like, I'm trying to make a loaf of bread. But it is funny how much you think, wow, this actually... This explains a lot. This is right, and it spreads from house to house, up and down the street. Yeah, people, the the yeast of of what's going on in one home. It's hard to stop. <laughs> is enormously attractive. Yeah, and other people, you know, can we do a Sabbath dinner? And then Sabbath dinners, weekly. So I've noticed something in our Sabbath dinners or our holiday prep uh, when Thanksgiving rolls around or 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 Christmas. Sometimes it's like a uh, Christmas is kind of of a lesser event. Oh, it's the, really chill compared it's <laughs> compared chill to compared to <laughs> <laughs> it is. But I think it's because we tend to have actually less people at Christmas dinner. So everything seems very like, wow, look at us plating a salad. <laughs> we're, all, we're all feeling very chill about that. But but it's not if you're not used to feeding people, then the yeah. Christmas dinner was a so, real But if you're surprise. selling basically if you have Sabbath dinners or, or Sunday dinners mm -hmm. or some, something like that that's part of the culture of the family, it's part of the right. schedule, it's part of the rhythm, the yeah. calendar, then everybody's in training all year long for the high festivals. Yeah, totally. Right. And, and, and you're equipped to not be so stressed out about the executing of it. Right. Because, and then it is stressful for a lot. If you don't have a lot of practice, Thanksgiving and Christmas can be very stressful and that's that's fine because you have to start somewhere. You have to you have to get doing it and uh, practicing. But I think that the regular practicing at really more humble, more humble levels, really strengthens you in a way that many. I think a lot of Christian women don't want to be bad at things. They won't do things that don't come naturally to them right at first. Mm -hmm. So bread baking is a great example. They may have tried one time to make bread with no idea how yeast works or what's happening, and it flopped. And then they are like, I can't do that. I am unable. Right. I have flopped more loaves of... I have, <laughs> I have flopped a heck of a lot of things that I've tried to do. But if you just keep trying, pretty soon you're like, oh, I can do that. I do know how to, yeah. how to do this. Uh, and I actually think... One of the things I think is, this is an out of context Bible verse, but not really. It's just, okay. I think I think it's probably one of my favorite passages about hospitality, but it's not about hospitality. It's about suffering. Um, I think it's 2 Corinthians about the comfort, which he comforted us with, which yeah. has equipped us to comfort others with the comfort with which we were comforted. Like yeah. that, And hospitality is so much about comfort. Table fellowship is so much about comfort. And a lot of people are trying, like they set their sights on something that they have never experienced. Like they're like, I'm going to try to do something that I actually don't know or understand in any way. Whereas if you begin with what has God given you that has blessed and comforted you and you begin sharing that, like you begin thinking, mm -hmm. how can I have, and even though that passage is about suffering, every human has had knows what it is to be hungry, to be cold, to be tired, to be like, it doesn't really matter how rich you are. You've been hungry. Right. You've been physically uncomfortable. You've needed to sit down at a table and, and enjoy the fellowship of others. And we live in a therapeutic society that wants to fix everything with 
either meds or counseling mm -hmm. sessions, like therapy. And But if we just pursued one of the key ingredients of human thriving, yeah. which is table fellowship, uh, fellowship. Warm, warm fellowship over hot food, yeah. right? Like, Where you, whoa, you, <laughs> and, we could get off some of these antidepressants. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah, there, there's a lot of, um, we need more soup. Yeah. Well, the thing that I love about that is that there there are families who would think, oh, we don't know how to do anything. We don't know how to do anything nice like that. Like, but, but it's not true that they don't have things that delight them. Like if they've never been delighted by any food, then they need to get right with God. Like if they've, if they've never experienced anything that blessed them, yeah. that God gave us in some way. And I think and that is why I'm a big fan of people starting with what you actually love or what you appreciated and sharing it, whether it is a can of beans and sliced hot dogs. If that's what your family's into, have people over for that. Like start with that. So I, I recently received a question from someone who wanted to know how strict we were on Sabbath attendance. So strict. D did, so strict. <laughs> well, um, and I, I guess this would be, I'd like to ask you to comment on this. We always emphasize this is a get to, not a got to. Right. Um, we want to make it warm and inviting and you're welcome. Come and go as you please, you know, please, yeah. you're welcome. Mm -hmm. But no, no, no problem if you've got something else to do or whatever. Right. And a lot of people don't, if, a lot of people have a legalistic turn of mind where they think that if we don't make attendance mandatory, then people are going to stop people are going to yeah. uh, start misbehaving and going other places. And it's like... Uh, I'm going to make this dinner and no one will appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, it's like a, a young married couple visiting the folks and they're about to leave and they're having a conversation on the doorstep. Why can't you stay another three days? And the thought bubble above their heads is because of conversations like this one. Yes. Because right? we don't want to be here because this is because, not enjoyable. Yeah. The thing that people don't understand is the that the law, law as raw, raw law, drives yeah. people away. Mm -hmm. And this is a gospel event. This is an invitation right. event. This is um, come and welcome. Yeah, Does totally. It, and I would say, I would say that it's, a, it's an especially Christian art to show no strings attached hospitality right. like that that's a thing that is not done like uh in the world it can't be done unless you're genuinely doing what you're doing to offer it to god mm -hmm. then there's always some kind of a string attached you're always wanting someone's approval or praise or you're wanting someone to pay you back by having you over or you're wanting to get into a friend group there's always some you know some other motive in play and people sense that like people have a enough radar, they a have radar. a radar for that you know when you're being you can feel it in the air that you're being tried like led somewhere then nobody wants that and it's and it's not winsome to children it's like people saying this is our family game night you yeah. will sit down and play games with us. It's Buster. like Buster. nobody <laughs> wants to be there for this. This is the most miserable thing. So I would say just not aside from hospitality, just with our own kids in our own home, that is something that we focus on anyways, is wanting it to be that they can't, that they are invited all the time, but not that we're patrolling them all through the house to make yeah. sure they want to come hang out. And if with you us. want to mortify, if you see that tendency in yourself and you want to mortify it, then maybe pursue what the Lord said about inviting people who can't invite you back. <laughs> yeah, right. exactly. Right. It's a great, uh, it's a great place to begin yeah, practicing. Uh, yeah, and that's why Peter says. That's your children, by the way. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> There's very kid. little they can do in return <laughs> at the beginning. Yeah. And when they first go into the kitchen to try to pay you back. It make, costs making, you more. It costs make, you more than you thought. Making pancakes on Mother's Day when you're, they're five, <laughs> let's say. <laughs> well, I would say there's also this is this is just funny. I know we did this to you and mom, but right now I am very tempted all the time. I take pictures of here's a picture of me trying to go to bed because I, I'm like, well, I'm off to bed, and it's like, boom, five teenagers are on the bed. <laughs> <laughs> we're here to talk. We're all ready to have it. I'm like, well, this is a great meeting time. But it is, it's totally, that's the kind of thing that it would be bizarre if you were trying to make it happen. But stewarding yeah. the desire for fellowship and everyone telling funny stories after you meant to be in bed is 
you you accept what God is giving you, and you right. want to cultivate that kind of thing without without um, obligating it. So open handedness is enormously attractive, and open handedness mm-hmm. open handedness from the heart out. Yes, you, um, is and people want to come and. Okay, we want we want to regulate and make sure you you're paying your due. Mm-hmm. That's the law, and that's makes people want to go somewhere else. Totally. One the uh, years ago, we did this thing where we would do a lunch in the park, where we would take lunch for tons of kids. We would make lunch for I don't know two hundred kids, take it to the park, and a bunch. Of, we had a Facebook group, so a lot of ladies in our church would all come, and there'd be. I would bring iced coffee, and they would bring salads for lunch, and then whoever was in the park, we would just invite. Eat with us, you know, like join us. But the funny thing is that's very open-handed because it's very clear that to that person in the park that you're not asking them to do something for you. Right. This is just this is just a clear off. But it also was the first time in my experience that I had total strangers essentially coming up to you to say, so what is the reason for the hope that is in you? <laughs> like, and almost in those exact words, why, like where they're saying, but why are you happy to do this? Like, why mm-hmm. are you wanting to get, and it was such an interesting experience, but I think it was the foreign, the foreign experience of open-handed, like that these were people who had not experienced that right. before. And it was bizarre enough to them that they're like, I need to find someone here who can answer for me. Right. Why are these women so full of hope? So the um, hospitality, the discipline, of, so hospitality is potent and is potent in culture building. Mm -hmm. So so, uh, let's say this is a contagious sort of thing, which it is, Mm -hmm. and it starts spreading from the executive of the home in biblical framework. The executive home is mom and the wife and mom. Mm -hmm. And it starts spreading from family to family that way. And you you get to the point where you have a disciplined cadre of women who are uh, competent. Yeah. What what impact does that have? What what sort of cultural influence do women have that way? I think it's actually huge. We weirdly we live in a part of the country that doesn't have like that is young enough and that was the wild west mm-hmm. that we don't have as much of a heritage that is a result of that right. where we live. But there's any kind of regional foods and re- like any place that you go where you find what like what are the traditions here? It's it's been run by probably women competing at state fairs for the best right. whatever pie or whatever, like that this is, or sometimes it's the bakeries fighting over things, you know, like who's going to be the best at doing this thing that locally we love. Yeah. Like we decided as a people that we love this. And so we're going to fight about it. We're going to have the best yeah. Philly cheesesteak that anyone ever had. You know what? It's yeah. interesting that way. But I would say the real thing that you're making is, is people. I would say women are very naturally this way and it can be either bad influence that gets passed around really quickly because women are so relationally oriented. They share all the time with each other things. And I can't even number how much with my own friends, how probably everyone has egged each other on to doing different things. Like, And what's interesting is that somebody's like, hey, I did this this was awesome. You should try it. And then it goes off. It's like a little, it's like a little viral infection of a community. Everybody has to try it. And then it sticks in some places. And that's how regional thing, like that's how it is in an area where, oh, the women in our church actually make excellent bread. The women in our church make beautiful pastries for Christmas morning, but it's not because anyone said, Hey women, you need to do this. It's because it's Women law, like to law, talk about it. <laughs> it's not a law that the elders determined. No, yeah. and it and it happened organically, like that, and that's how culture building has to happen. But it can't happen if nobody's doing things privately at home, working on things, learning things. Where all of a sudden it becomes contagious. So to wrap this up with one final observation, uh, if it's true that at a certain level you are what you eat, right? Yeah. And this is you, you mentioned a moment ago that this is ultimately not about building culture, but about growing people, Yeah. right? Mm-hmm. right. So, uh, and the people are grow- who are growing are growing as a result of having been fed, not just physically, but right. materially in the context and the word of God and everything. Yeah. So when someone comes into the 
kitchen where you're working and looks in the pot and says, what are you making? You shouldn't say chicken chili. You should say, I'm making warriors for the kingdom of God. <laughs> <laughs> I've never good. answered a question that way. I've never yeah. done it, but maybe I should have. <laughs> yeah, what I'm, what I'm making is people. But even that is... You can divide a starter. You can take over the world with that kind of thing. It keeps like you can take a little piece of it, send it to someone else's house, and it thrives for generations. Yes.